Hello, everyone. You are listening to the latest Flyers Talk podcast presented by Great Railing. I am Jordan Hall, and as always, I am joined by the dynamic Joe Forice. Joe, the Flyers are rather fittingly sliding to the finish line. They are on a six-game losing streak, and believe it or not, Joe, that matches only their third worst of the season. Because as we know, they had a 13-gamer, a 10-gamer, they had a six-gamer before this one, and now currently in another six-game slide. I think some fans are probably happy because it's definitely helping their draft lottery odds. They're on the verge of sliding into the bottom three past Dave Haxtell's Seattle Kraken. Joe, I want to ask you, with five games left, can they get a win here? Like, could they actually lose out? I think it maybe became somewhat of a thought as the losing streak started to build, but five games left, it certainly seems like it's not outside the realm of possibility. What do you think? Do you see a win here on the schedule? Well, I mean, it's they're not playing the best of the best. Um, so can I see them winning a game? Absolutely. But I could also see them losing every one of the games because – We saw what happened with the Buffalo home and home over the weekend. And we've seen how they've played against some of the lesser teams of late. I mean, it doesn't – I would say in the recent losing streak, it doesn't matter the quality of the opponent. Um, The Flyers are just – you know, different parts of their game are falling apart during, you know, individual games. Um, You know, last night we see how the end of the second period gets away from them. Um, You know, uh, and that really felt like the game was over once Toronto got a two-goal lead. And, you know, it's these self-inflicted sort of turnovers and bad line changes that we saw against Buffalo and kind of – turnovers that are happening and I and I'll use the the phrase that Al Morgani used on pregame live last night and that is you know a lot of the guys that you're the veterans that you're looking for to put out the fires are the guys that are starting the fires which is not encouraging because if it's one thing if it's the kids and the younger players that are starting and causing the problems but if your veterans are part of this landslide downhill um you really have multiple layers of problems and i feel like that's what the flyers are in the middle of right now um almost this feeling that they can't do anything right i mean martin jones you know I, nobody wants to hear that the goalie played well in games that they give up four and five goals but martin jones last night got hung out he he got hung out to dry it's just that simple and um you know that's what's going to happen when you when your goalie gets hung out to dry, particularly on the third goal, where Keith Yandel falls down after a turnover in the neutral zone, and you know the Leafs have just set sail. And it's not like it's you know Marner, Matthews, and Nylander that are on that breakaway. It's Simmons, Giordano, and um, and Jason Spezza who ends up scoring the goal. These are uh, and we brought it up last night. That was the oldest combined goal in the NHL this entire season. And I'm not saying guys that are, you know, mid to late 30s can't play anymore. But what I'm saying is it's not Marner, Matthews, Nylander making tic-tac-toe passes and boom, it's in the back of the net because that can happen to anyone. But breakdowns like that, you know, that just shows you where the Flyers are this season. I think that third goal last night is kind of a microcosm of where this team is. Yeah, truly. And the second period has been a nightmare for them. So it, it shows you it's just – Bad teams really can't piece together full games. Uh, they seldom do it, and the Flyers are a bad team this year, marred by injury, and now they're playing kids you know, purposefully. And, uh, yeah, you're just getting a product um, that you expect right now at this point in the season. But they've been outscored 16-3 to in the second period during this six-game losing streak. So, you know, they're having maybe decent starts here and there, but they're totally falling apart midway through the game. And it's just giving them – no chance in the third period. All six losses have been regulation losses too. So they haven't even had a point. They haven't even forced a game after regulation. Uh, it just feels like they're truly, truly playing out the string. Um, I wouldn't even blame some guys if they're struggling with motivation. 
Although I think I would blame them uh, because they are in the NHL. You should be playing for something. But uh, it just it just feels like people are counting down the games at this point. Joe, I think I do see a win uh, on the schedule the rest of the way. I do think they could beat Montreal coming up here. The Canadians are sliding as well. And as we all know, they're below the Flyers in the standings. And I, I could see them beating Ottawa at home on the final day of the regular season. Typically, the, those final home games in front of your fans, you, you get up for and you want to win. And Ottawa's um, nothing uh, really special. So I, I do see a win on the schedule here. I don't think they're going to lose out. But gosh, losing out would certainly be pretty darn damning given it would give them a third double-digit losing streak, which would be terrible to have on your resume in one season. And it would also match the all-time worst regulation um, loss total in franchise history at 48. So I think these are things the Flyers want to avoid, and I do think they will. Well, you know, when you look at this, you you have Mike Yo, you have the coaching staff, you have certain players who know that they won't be here next year, who may not be here next year. So those guys, yes, I think they want to avoid it. I'm not so sure that avoiding that is necessarily the number one concern, though, because um, it seems like Shane Wright would be the the overall number one pick. And if you fall into that bottom three, you have a better chance of getting the number one pick. And this team, as we know, does need to start to pile up the assets um, because there's not a quick fix to what's going on here. You have to get young talent and you have to get them in here and – getting a higher draft pick would help that. So I don't know. I don't know that, like, like if you polled Flyers fans, I'm not sure that you would get, you know, a lot of concern about them avoiding another 10-game losing streak. No. no In I fact, don't... you might get the other a- reaction, like lose all of them, you know, yep. type of thing, because uh... because of the draft status. I mean, you know, it's not any fe- – in three months, no one will remember whether or not they lost this met however many straight to lose the season. But if they end up with the number one pick, they will remember that. So I, I I don't I feel like there's definitely two ways to look at this. But as you said, the guys behind the bench, some of the guys on the bench, they're not thinking about that. No, the guys playing really don't honestly give a bleep about draft picks. Like they just don't like they have something to play for, whether it's for pride, uh, for a next contract, for playing time next year. Like, they're not thinking, oh, we might get a draft pick. But, of course, it's on the mind of management. Of course, it's on the mind of fans. And I do think probably management is not okay with this, but I think somewhat strategically they're obviously having guys that are maybe a little banged up definitely sitting out. Uh, do I think maybe a Rasmus Ristolainen or maybe a Carter Hart or a Cam Atkinson or a Cam York could they be playing right now if they're in a playoff race? And, you know, I don't know the severity of the injuries, but I bet you they would probably be thinking long and hard of, can they give it a go if the team was playing for something? They are not. They have kids that they want to play. And losing is only helping their lottery odds. And, uh, yeah, a, a, a top three draft pick or the number one overall pick is pretty juicy. And the Flyers are really on the verge of falling into the bottom three. They're only – a point ahead of the Kraken entering Wednesday and Seattle has two games in hand. Uh, it's looking like they could really could fall below Seattle. Who's actually starting to pick up some wins. They're playing a, they're playing a, a kid as well and starting to do some decent things. So uh, we will see how the Flyers play out these five, final five games. If they have another win in them um, and where they will fall uh, once the ping pong balls uh, start bouncing around. Flyers Talk is brought to you by Great Railing. Stop into Great Railing for the highest quality and lowest prices on all your railing, decking, and fencing needs. Well, Joe, as the Flyers are on this six-game losing streak and they're trying to break it, there are five games left, as we mentioned. From a positive standpoint, who would you like to see kind of close out the year strong? We have a lot of different storylines despite the team being out of contention and really kind of sliding to the finish line. But is there a player or somebody or something that you want to see kind of finish well here going into the offseason? Well, there's a couple of things I want I want to see. And, you know, we, we've seen um, 
a guy like Noah Cates really show that he has, uh, not to be cliche again, but a nose for the net. He knows where to go um, in the offensive zone. And I, I, I kind of would like to see a definitive sign that he belongs um, going forward in a role with this team. And I'm not saying he hasn't shown that so far, but I'm saying that continuation of that. You'd like to see some pieces that maybe you weren't sure of going forward make you a little bit more sure of before the season ends. And I just use Cates because he scored a few goals. Um, He's shown a presence in the zone. And, you know, the other guy I'll bring up is Ronnie Adderd in the in the in the sense that he is a player that is seems to play with a fearlessness on the ice and that he's not afraid to try things. You know, he gets the puck on net. He comes up with creative ways to create offense. And there's always room in this league for players like that, I think. So I'd like to see more of that from him in addition to him being defensively sound and and tightening that part of his game up. So I have my eyes on those two players. They're they're the guys I will be watching for. And then, of course, if York or um, Atkinson were to come back, I'd like to see them finish the season strong because, I mean, obviously with York, he's going to be a big piece of this team going forward. Same with Atkinson. Yeah, real good ones there. It does seem like you're really keeping an eye on some of the just the kids and the prospects. Like when you see them do something, a glimpse of something, you think to yourself, oh, wow, like, you know, I could see this uh, happening next year or in the future here. It just seems like that's one of the such a, one of the big reasons to watch this team here is to see some of these kids and if they can fit here next season or in the future. So I like those picks, Joe. For me, I, I'm going to go Joel Farabee. I would really like to see him reach 20 goals. Uh, that would be a second straight year of 20 goals for him uh, in shortened years. Last year, he led the team with 20 in the shortened 56-game season, and he did it at 21 years old. I thought that was huge for um, the future of the organization, that they that they landed a, a, a first-round pick in the teens and, and can make him a foundation piece. And now he has 17. He's missed 19 games because of injury and illness, but he has a chance to get 20. And I think that would really set him up for his first full NHL season. He hasn't played a full NHL season yet um, in the 80, you know, 70 to 80 game range. And I really think it could set him up for a 30 goal year eventually. I think that's the goal and what the upside is for Joel Farabee is 30 goals in a year. uh, That would be exciting for a team that is starved for goal scoring. So I would like to see Joel Farabee get 20 goals, back to back 20 goal seasons and really set up for a big, big, big year uh, where his contract kicks in and he's really starting to look like one of the guys. He's not a kid anymore uh, in many people's eyes. He's going to be one of the guys, and I think that would be good for Joel Farabee to really shoot for 30. Now that he's got two 20s under his belt, uh, I think shooting for 30 would be crazy to say. So, Joe, I'm kind of looking at Joel Farabee. Yeah, you know what's interesting when you when you bring this up and you brought up the 20 goal thing? And uh, Have you ever uh... – seen more of a contrast in feels of a 20 goal season than Joel Faraby and James Van Riemsdyk on this team. <laughs> sure. Oh man. It's just true. so different how both guys are probably going to be in that 20 plus goal area. And the, the feel of each of those guys, individual seasons is so different. And I, and I just, I just think the flyers need more out of JVR. And that's the main reason you feel that way is because I don't think anybody went into the season, including JVR himself, saying my goal is to have a 20-goal season. So I think that's what it is. And then when you factor in the injuries that Farabee dealt with and that he's still getting 20 goals, it has a bit of a different feel to it because he might have been in that 30-goal category if he didn't miss time with a couple different injuries. But I just, as you were saying that, I was thinking that, you know, the different feelings of these guys' seasons and on pregame live we've been – kind of grading and breaking down individual guys' seasons, and we just talked about JVR last night. So, um, you know, it, it's interesting, and, and you wonder if, if a guy like JVR is part of this going forward uh, or if he's a candidate for a, a buyout or, you know, something potentially along those lines. Because, you know, it's interesting, too. I was thinking last night, when he's clicking on the power play, 
it's just such a different feel in the power play. And he's such a streaky player yep. that it feels like they're going to score on every power play when he's going. But then when he's not going, he's not the most noticeable player. He's, he's very much a power play, disrupt the front of the net type of player. And um, I, I just don't think the Flyers have gotten enough of that from him this year. No, I think that's completely fair, Joe. And you are looking for more than 21 goals for James Ray Marines, like given he's making $7 million a year. He's making some of the most money on the roster, and he's a goal scorer. So I think it's totally fair that people were hoping for more than 21 goals from James Van Riemsdyk. I think he's got only 30 or so points, I believe. Um, obviously, he's not a huge assist guy. And, you know, he really had one of his best years as a flyer last season. I really thought Elaine Vigneault got him playing some of the best 200-foot hockey of his career. Um, I mean, he was tied for the team leading points last year. And in his first season with the Flyers, before AV arrived, he had his best goal-scoring year. He probably would have finished with 30 if he didn't get hurt early on in year one of his contract. But, yeah, it, there is a, a really stark contrast, without a doubt, between Joel Farabee's goal total and James Van Riems. Like, and it dawned on me that JVR is the only Flyer that's played in all 77 this year. It dawned on me the last night because uh, I knew Cam Atkinson was one of the only guys that had played in all game, in all of the Flyers games, and then he got hurt. So I was like, oh, wait, I believe there's only one more left, and it was JVR. So he's played in all 77, 21 goals. I think everyone uh, would like to maybe see more of a defensive effort from him. Uh, but he's never been a, like a defensive guru or anything. Uh, but you can certainly play a different game 200 feet. Um, and, yeah, it's very – I mean, I think game. everybody would kind of – and I'm not knocking his game because there's plenty of one-trick pony guys in this league that are great players. Um, but when you're that kind of player who has a, a specialty like JVR and your specialty is not there, then it becomes like, okay, what is he bringing to the ice on a day, on a game-by-game -game basis? Yeah, And, you know – you're no, you're not looking for your wingers to get down there and and get super dirty in the defensive end. Yeah, but they need to be sound, as you mentioned. You can play a 200 foot game without being Patrice Bergeron or Claude Giroux or you know uh, uh, Sean Couturier. Um, the Flyers aren't asking JVR to be that, but to be a little more noticeable. And as we said, if if your specialty is goal scoring, 21 goals is not really what you go into the season saying setting as your benchmark. Uh, it needs to be a little higher than that. I mean, uh, he, after the game, talked about going back to Toronto where he was for the middle portion of his career between flyer stints. And, you know, one of his years in Toronto, he scored 38 goals. I think this is a much different looking flyers team if you're getting 35 even 30 goals from JVR. Yeah. I think we're talking much more differently about his contribution to the team, his standing with the team, his future with the team, if we're looking at 30-plus goals rather than 20-plus goals. Yeah, and I've always been a believer that James Van Reems like needs to play with high-end talent. Like He's a very good complementary piece to high-end centers uh, because he's a finisher and he knows how to get to the net. He knows how to complement playmakers. Like he's one of the better net front guys in the league. He's a goal scorer. He's always been so much better when he's playing with like a high end center. And he hasn't had that this year. He's he like, he's like, there's just been so much moving parts and I'm not, I'm not justifying James Van Reems like scoring 21 goals. I just think we're seeing it in his numbers when he's not with a high end talent, his numbers suffer. It's just, it's just clear as day. Uh, he he is better when he's in a top six role consistently with a big time playmaker. It's been nothing but moving parts here this season, and you're seeing it in his numbers. Um, you're seeing 21 goals, whereas and, and 34 points. Whereas if he was with a guy consistently all year, maybe he creeps into the 25 to 30 range. His points are probably higher, uh, and he's probably better defensively too. Um, I just and that makes you wonder: Will he be here moving forward? Um, if the Flyers are going to be making some big splashes, they might have to clear money. It's just the way the game is right now with the tight cap 
and what the economic impact has uh, endured here through COVID-19. Teams need to clear money to add something with money. And uh, it, it really do, does make you wonder if JVR will be here moving forward. He does have, uh, after this season, uh, one more year left on his deal uh, at $7 million cap hit. So we will see. We will see what the future holds for JVR. But, um, yeah, all 77 games, Joe, and 21 goals for JVR. But I think a lot of people wanted more. I think that's fair. Well, Joe, this was fun. Uh, we have five more games left. We will break it all down and uh, have plenty of talk here over the final stretch of this season as the Flyers play out another playoffless season. Two straight now for the Flyers. But thanks so much, Joe. As always, great seeing you and great chatting with you. A, a special thank you to Ben Berry, our podcast producer, for always being flexible with our, with our time. And Flyers fans, of course, as always, thank you for listening to the latest Flyers Talk podcast presented by Great Railing. Wherever you get your podcasts, please rate and listen, and we can't wait to talk to you next time.